So how does the court do its business? I have to give a bit of a health warning here because it's 13 years since I left Strasbourg and I try hard to keep up, but it's very difficult because there is so much going on there. Um, so there's a slight health warning and your professors may well be able to correct me on some things if I'm incorrect uh, in subsequent uh, lectures. There are original applications which may be made literally by just a letter sent by an ordinary person saying that uh, their country has done something which violates their rights under the convention and uh, and uh, that, that they are uh, they have suffered damage as a result thereof that will be taken on board by the registry staff and will be processed through a system that provides for single judges <clears throat> three judge committees chambers of five chambers of seven judges and one grand chamber of 17 judges the single judge committee uh, deals with cases that are clearly and obviously not appropriate for the Court of Human Rights for all sorts of different reasons, perhaps because they arise out of events occurring long before a particular country joined the Council of Europe or where, for instance, some people try to sue the United States of America before the European Court of Human Rights, an impossibility. They're not parties to the Convention. Uh, so very simple and clear cases that are going nowhere are uh, dealt with by single judge committees. And those in fact have dealt with enormous numbers. 33,288 were declared, uh, applications were declared inadmissible by single judge committees in the year 2019. So that's a very good way of dealing with the vast number of applications that come in. The three judge committees uh, may also find cases inadmissible or they may find violations in relation to cases where there is the, 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 juristic, uh, the jurisprudence is well established and there is no need for the case to go any further or receive any further consideration. However, the cases that do raise uh, real issues of concern uh, legally and otherwise are will be sent to chambers of seven judges. There are five of these and there they will be dealt with quite frequently, not without a public hearing. There aren't all that many public hearings in the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, the cases may be brought before the, uh, the, the, the the chamber of seven and in many cases may be disposed of relatively quickly with a judge rapporteur outlining the case to his or her colleagues discussion taking place a decision being made uh, the matter being adjourned to a, a, a panel that will draft the judgment in in association with the registry and then subsequently brought back and agreed as a judgment so what are some of the uh, by the way, could I ask uh, whoever is in charge to please let me know when 25 minutes have passed. Uh, I don't want to uh, mess up the time schedule here. I won't take offence, I promise. Uh, and I'll finish up then because I can really bail out almost any time I, I, I need. Um, but uh, just a few of the issues that regularly arise uh, in cases and that cause them to be decided one way or the other. The obligation to exhaust domestic remedies is one of the key uh, matters and this is because every member state is entitled to resolve the convention issue in its own legal system before a person refers it for international supervision and uh, that is a <clears throat> that can be at times a very controversial uh, matter. Uh, one of the early cases that I was involved in as judge rapporteur was the interstate case of Cyprus versus Turkey, and that was a case where uh, Turkey had invaded Cyprus and set up the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. The Greek Cypriots who lived there, of course, bitterly resented this and uh, did not want to recognize the state in any way at all. But the convention requires that there be no human rights vacuum. So Turkey, a member of the Council of Europe, was obliged to ensure that courts that could deal with people's uh, complaints and provide effective remedies should exist. But of course, they didn't want to. The 
the Turkey, uh, the Greek Cypriots in the so-called TRNC didn't want to do this. It was uh, highly offensive to them. Our court in Cyprus versus Turkey in a very controversial decision found that they had to do that. And the reason for that was based firstly upon the Namibia opinion of 1971 of the International Court of Justice, uh, which dealt with a situation where there was de facto illegal, de facto regimes such as that of South Africa in Namibia. Their UN uh, uh, right to run the place had been withdrawn. But the Namibia opinion of the ICJ observed that, of course, if this happens, that human life still goes on. There have to be births, deaths, marriages registered, contracts have to be honoured. Otherwise, the oppressed people are even more oppressed. So there has to be some measure of recognition of the acts of so-called de facto regimes. And in that context, we took the view, it was the decision of the court, that the, even the, uh, the, the Greek Cypriots in the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus had to exhaust the remedies in the courts that had been established. Another reason for the court's decision was that it would be entirely anomalous if the, the convention requiring it's a country such as Turkey to establish in the TRNC courts that provided protection for human rights were then not obliged or were, were not able to actually operate them uh, because people wouldn't go there. It would also turn the court in Strasbourg into a court of first instance. So that was the obligation to exhaust domestic remedies. Uh, the court couldn't be a first instance court, but it also can't be a fourth instance court, by which I mean that it is the procedure and effects in that procedure that must be examined by the court and found to offend against the convention, rather than the court focusing on the outcome of the case itself. Another element of the uh, of the court regularly uh, 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 arising is that of the margin of appreciation. This is a very difficult and complex area and I tried for the purposes of this uh, lecture, I tried to sum it up as simply as I could as follows. Where independent and impartial domestic courts have analysed in a comprehensive and convincing manner the contested legal measure on the basis of the relevant human rights standards and provides relevant and sufficient reasons for their decisions, the court will rarely intervene. This uh, is strongly connected, this margin of appreciation, to the concept of the subsidiarity principle, which is that human rights like charity begin at home, and it is in the domestic courts that the convention should develop and should be given effect in the ideal world, which will never exist. Strasbourg wouldn't need to exist. The Human Rights Convention would be implemented nationally. Uh, of course, that's never going to happen. Uh, and there will be always a need for the court in Strasbourg to be the final authoritative voice. Uh, but what it does provide is a very interesting um, view in terms of the, uh, the, the, the development of the convention, because what it really emphasizes is that it is a code of minimum standards and that in fact the individual countries can go as far beyond the, the, the general view of uh, the law as they wish in implementing and interpreting the convention. Of course, it only binds themselves. Uh, but the idea is that what is really aimed for is an inconsistency of rising standards, but all countries must comply with the minimum standard. 